Welcome to this session. Welcome to the Cancer Caregiver Journey with Ann Jones. Ann Jones is a certified advanced oncology nurse with and a board certified nurse coach and a PhD candidate. Ann researches caregiving, how care partners navigate their way through their cancer journey, and which social supports are most beneficial. Ann's most important role now is being a, a care partner and advocate for her father who is experiencing pancreatic cancer. Thank you, Ann. Thank you. Thank you. We are going to be a very small group, as you know, and, and because you can see. But I'm curious as to how many people here are actually caregivers or have been a caregiver to a cancer patient or a cancer survivor. So we've got a lot of people in that arena. Um, how many people here are nurses or the such that work in oncology in one way or another? So, okay. And how many are cancer survivors who, how many are cancer survivors, number one? Okay, and how many are cancer survivors here because they're curious as to what caregivers go through or thinking about? So, okay, that pretty much, that pretty much covers it. So, um, we've already, you can, you've read the professional piece of this. Um, so we'll see if we can keep this moving. I have to say, I have to disclose that I have no relevant commercial relationships. Um, it's just part of what we have to do. And I am a bit nervous, and so we'll just, uh, you know, that's just how it is. Um, but one thing I do want to do real quickly, um, when he was announcing um, who I am, if you will, that just means I'm old. And it just means that there's a lot of things that have been done. And I'm going to talk about me in just a minute uh, for a particular purpose. But, but as I have had a 33-plus year, uh, I'd have to stop and think about that. It's longer than that. But anyway, 30-plus year um, nursing career. One of the things that I um, have come to appreciate and did not appreciate it earlier was being in the present moment. And so if you all don't mind just kind of putting your paper and pencils and stuff away for a moment, we're going to do a little, um, little mindfulness activity. So if that's okay, join me. If not, just, just it'll be over in a middle, matter of minutes. So. Um, if you would, just kind of um, get comfortable of where you're at so that we can prepare to focus the next hour on the topic of caregivers um, on the cancer journey. And so you might want to, um, or I'll explain to you that I will be asking you to do something that's called shift, appreciate, and wait. And it will not take more than a minute. And um, so if you would lower your eyes or just shut your eyes and go soft for a minute. And as you're getting comfortable, shift your attention to your breath. Close your eyes. Um, for the next 10, th 10 seconds, take a couple of deep breaths and just notice your breath as you inhale and as you exhale. Inhaling and exhaling. And as you continue to breathe, appreciate yourself for some aspect of caregiving you have provided. Maybe professionally, for a family member, maybe a child, maybe a sick puppy. Whatever the situation may be or have been, just appreciate that aspect of self for the next few seconds. And finally, just wait. Just wait in quietude with your thoughts and your breathing to see what surfaces for you. Just a total of 30 seconds. Breathing in, breathing out, and waiting.
at your convenience and in your own time, just come back to the space that we are sharing together. Thank you for humoring me on that point. But I have come to learn um, that sometimes to be able to focus, we just need to take that time out. I call it my time out. And um, now there's two points that I want to get across to you today. Not about who I am necessarily, um, but I want you to take away, if you take nothing else away, that the power of the story, your story, is really important. Okay. Um, and the second thing that I want you to take away from today is, is that self-compassion is very important. And um, we have compassion for everybody else, but we don't necessarily have self-compassion. And hopefully these things will become way more important when we get to the end of what we have to discuss today. So, but since I said that um, the power of the story is very important, I've been introduced, but that's not really who I am. This is really who I am. And this is a really good picture if um, the lights are out and you know you could really see it and stuff. And the color of the hair is not the same as what's on my head right now, but it's OK. It's a professional picture. But um, a little bit about me. The things, and I love this new pointer, so I'll point. I am a registered nurse. And I have come um, to appreciate this profession in which I am in. And it has allowed me to do so many things, to care give in so many different ways. And after all these years, um, I, I just can't imagine myself in any, in any other place. And the possibilities have been very good to me. Second thing, and I disclosed this proudly, um, took me a long time, I am not a Husker, I am a Jayhawk. And that means I came from Kansas. And um, I also, um, so two notes about that. Yes, we are the national basketball champions from <laughs> for this year. And the other thing is, is there's this guy by the name of Fog Allen, and that's where we play when we're at home. And Fog, P-H-O-G. Well, that is important for me because I am living kind of in a fog right now. Um, some people, it, we're all living in a fog. People that have had COVID, that's me, twice. I still have the after effects of, of the fog that comes along with that. Uh, I'm living in the fog of having a parent who I'm um, trying to care for him um, under very difficult situations, but everybody's situations are differently. And so I will appreciate you having compassion for me in my state of fog, um, if you will. And then I'm an oot student. What that means is, is that I am at the University of Utah um, working on my PhD. So when he said PhD candidate, yes, this old girl um, went back to school for, min for more years than I this last go around. But I'm learning. And you are never too old to learn. That's my, that's my um, belief. So um, it's the University of Utah oots, in case anybody. Um, and then I am a granny to be. Now I am a granny already, um, but my biological, my only biological son is going to give me a bio, biological specimen um, of DNA that's just mine. <laughs> and her name is Eliza Page. And it's the first name comes from um, our family. So I'm very excited about that, of course. And then I am a volunteer. I volunteer probably too much sometimes. But anyway, um, I volunteer for a time to heal. Um, I volunteer for um, our organization Wings of Hope over in Council Bluffs, which is where I live, and Mock-Ons and, and what have you, which is our uh, professional nursing society locally. And I am a family caregiver, and you already know. Um, it's not the first time, but it's the worst time, I think. So anyway, that's me, and that is way more than you cared to know about me. So we have to start um, a little bit by looking at the magnitude of what, what we've got here. Um, this is a discussion about caregivers and care partners. I use that word interchangeably. Some people may not have heard care partners, um, but it is an emerging word, if you will. So we'll talk about that in the definition. But you also are going to hear me talk about care um, survivors 
so cancer survivors. And we're going to get really muddy and mixed up in here. And you're going to wonder, am, am I really, is this really a conversation about cancer survivors? Or is this a conversation about caregivers of cancer survivors? Um, and that's on purpose, is to make you all confused for a little while, OK? But the, we all know that cancer is on the rise. Um, that may have taken a little dip just because of COVID and people not getting out and getting screened, but it's still on the rise. And um, if, if um, cancer is on the rise, that means caregiving is on the rise. Um, we have right now 16.9 million um, cancer survivors, and it's predicted to go up to 22.2 by 2030. That's only eight years, that's only eight years away. Um, great. It is really good to have cancer um, people surviving from cancer. But this number right here, um, it's not a very good number because, um, I mean, it's a wide range. How many cancer patients do we really, or, or how many caregivers do we really have taking care of cancer um, patients and survivors? And exactly when are they doing the caregiving? And what is the care, you know, are you a caregiver for life? How long are you a caregiver? What is that definition? Really don't know. There's not, there's a cancer registry. We know how many cancer um, cancers have been diagnosed in this country, but we don't know how many caregivers are actually a part of that. No, by the way, there's primary caregivers, but then you have a network of support people that are also helping to, to do caregiving a lot of times. So, and the other key point here is, is that it's unpaid care. Uh, that unpaid care, if this is the true range, is about $33 billion of free care that's being given, um, which is a lot. That's important because if that's how much it's worth, or and it's probably more, then why don't we value caregiving on a day-to-day -day basis even more? That, that's part of my point. And then care partners or caregivers, 25% of them currently are over the age of 65. That can mean a lot of things that I won't go into um, right now. And then can the cancer course. How is cancer or is cancer different, any different than any other kind of caregiving? Um, there's a lot of research out there in the dementia caregiving arena, and they are the ones that have led the way. But, um, and, and cancer is not close behind, but it's the second behind as far as research being done but the course of cancer is unpredictable, it's episodic and intense. We all know that it doesn't go in a straight line, right? So speaking of straight lines, this is my sole concoction. This is my, um, so this is not attributed to anybody else, so don't take it too, too far. But survivorship, we have definitions of survivorship that say, um, and endorsed by the National Cancer Institute and the office that, the, that resides under the cancer, um, the NCI, which is the Office of Cancer Survivorship, um, that defines cancer survivorship from diagnosis to end of life. Well, boy, that really narrows it down, doesn't it? And then on top of that, um, as more survivors have, cancer survivors are out there, um, they've also included caregivers, family members, neighbors, friends, anybody who's touched by cancer. So yeah, that makes it pretty confusing. Um, I am not very good with graphics, so I do not want to and, um, connote that this is a step-by-step -step process. But um, one way of going through this could be diagnosis, treatment, the wait and see period, which is often where when we talk about a survivorship phase, if you will, kind of um, pops in there, but that doesn't even, doesn't even hold very well. And you know, we can go from diagnosis to advanced disease, and this just all goes in all kinds of circles. And um, the word survivorship, and this is where I'm sure I'll miss up some of my points. Um, very quickly, it's complicated this word survivorship. I've already tried to confuse you a little bit, but when you look at um, just the terminology itself, survivor survivorship, the clinical significance of the word survivorship has a lot of connotations when you think about the, the biospecimen side of things, you know? It's um, are we cured, are we not cured? That type of thing. Then when we look at it from a population context, um, the old adage has been if you make it five years, 
then you're a survivor. That, that's another way to look at it, but that's kind of becoming old and outdated. Um, All-inclusive, I've already explained, you know, the, the definition. I mean, if it's your family, if it's your caregiver, or if, um, from a survivor standpoint, uh, com confusing. And then I've already talked about the distinct phase. Well, what about the contextual considerations? If you think about it from a historical perspective, when we didn't have cancer survivors, so to speak, the survivor was actually the caregiver or the family that was left after their, the patient um, had died. So that's where survivor actually starts. But there's so many, from, the, um, from a political standpoint, um, I guess it's right here. From a political standpoint, survivorship has been important in our in policy, and the verbs and the words have come forward. And there are, um, and from a cultural standpoint, it means something different from culture to culture, and and then socially, um, survivorship. Interesting, the um, the scientific world, if you will, or the medical world, really latched onto what the lay public did. You think of Lance Armstrong. Um, movement, you think of um, pink ribbons, you think of all of the different things that signify what a cancer survivor is. That came from groundswell of um, cancer survivors themselves. Um, some of those people were medical, but it came from the, from the lay public. Now, what about labels? Do labels matter? You know, somebody, some people, and I'm talking about cancer survivors right now, um, embrace that term, you know, warrior. There's all there's all these words, warrior and um, survivor, and I, I beat the war. And you see an obituary sometimes. We lost our battle, or or what have you. Some some arenas people embrace those things because they do feel like a warrior, or what have you. However, there's another crew, um, another in the literature, if you will, that shows that people are resistant to that. Because it's not the whole, you know, having cancer to some people is not the Holocaust. It's not those dying in Ukraine. You can go on and on and think about that, that it, that it wasn't that bad. And think about the hundreds, 100 plus different kind of cancers that there are. All the trajectories are different. Some people, um, you know, their experiences are different. We have to think of cancer patients and survivors as an N of one, right? Because it's the person. And so the person taking care of the N of one is also one person having their own experience. And symbols and inferences. Um, we've already, you know, symbols create many, meaning. We've talked about pink ribbons. We've talked about the brace, different colored bracelets. Um, we've talked about, um, you know, purple t-shirts for pancreatic cancer and the different walks and what have you. Um, those symbols, we know immediately what they mean out in the community. And it sets different expectations. Uh, how many, any, I, I don't know the answer to this, but how many um, organizations do you think that are out there that are supporting, you know, different cancers or a different aspect of the cancers? There's tons. There's tons of them out there. Um, do our cancer patients always know about them? Not always, but there are a lot that are out there. And so then looking at language. Um, does language matter? Language does matter. These symbols and these inferences that come up, that builds some kind of concept, the concept of survivorship. We may not be able to describe it, but we can see it. We know it. We get a picture, and we could draw a picture and explain it to some degree. Um, and when you do build a concept, then there's a phenomena that starts and is reflected then in policy, in research and in practice. Um, so where does caregiver fit in all of this survivorship? This is what, where we're trying to really get to. Um, what we do know is, is that what impacts the cancer survivor also impacts the caregiver. And we do know that the caregiver has their own experience. And I'm going to say over and over again, caregivers have their own feelings their own thoughts, things that are going on inside them, whether or not they recognize it or not. I mean, we know that. And then for the caregiver, in that whole cancer trajectory and in the transitions, um, let me fly back here. 
Well, I, I won't fly back because I'll probably screw something up. But when you think about that concocted model that I had up there, there's diagnosis. You know, you, you know that, you, that there's a transition from not having cancer to the diagnosis. And then there's another transition that you can see from diagnosis to whatever the treatment's going to be, and maybe different treatments. And then you have another one into the survivorship or the wait and see. We got a scan that comes up in four months that'll tell us something, um, you know, uh, something. And then, of course, advanced disease and what have you. So there's very key transition points. Those transition points for cancer survivors are the same for the caregivers. They react a little bit differently, we know, in them. But, um, but in those transitions, roles and relationships are constantly changing. And you, and you know what that means. Um, continued caregiving is needed. We, even after a cancer patient or a cancer survivor, moves into maybe not having treatment anymore or maybe just taking hormonal therapy um, on an extended basis or what have you, um, they still have emotional needs. And in fact, that's the top number one. There's sequela from the, from the physical, just the treatment and um, the cancer itself. It changes the physical, physical nature of the person. You know, maybe a mastectomy, if nothing else which is not nothing else, that's a big deal. Um, financial, we all know, um, we all hear about financial toxicity now. And then spiritual, just what the heck does this all mean? What, what did I do? These same things, not only is the caregiver take, or care partner trying to support the cancer patient and survivor in this arena, they also are going through those very same things themselves. They might not have had any sleep for weeks, a physical problem, scared to death of what might be happening down the path, et cetera. So as I, take the, as I take us back to the language, there is no language at this point in time for a caregiver, for a care partner, for a family member taken care of. There, there is no phenomena. It's just not recognized. We know that there's a caregiver, but what kind of support is there for them? They're spotty, but, but in the literature, in the, all the work that I've been reading, there's just not much there. And then maybe more, if nothing else, if we're not concerned about the caregiver themselves, or the caregiver is not, com is not concerned about themselves, here's the one point right down here. It is predictive how well the cancer survivor will do how well the caregiver is doing can predict how well the cancer survivor is doing. So if the caregiver is supportive, loving, giving, going, you know, then their cancer survivor has an opportunity to be, to do even better and adapt in whatever way that, that is, okay? It's a whole nother lecture on its own. Um, in the shadows. In the shadows, um, we, these three things right here, the medical community, this is not to bash the medical community. I'm part of the medical community, but what we are concerned about is getting that cancer patient um, cured, getting them to a spot that they can live their life and their quality of life. Um, there are people, um, there are healthcare professionals that will ask the caregiver if they happen to show up to the appointment, how are you doing? And they'll ask it two or three times because they want to get to the caregiver and say, how are you doing? But that's, but that's not regular. We don't have a line in our medical record that, you know, that we check that, that we've done that assessment. That's not common. And we certainly don't have a caregiver, survive, a caregiver survivorship plan either. That, that, I mean, that doesn't happen. And then society and social support dynamic. There's a lot of things that, that can happen there. Um, not very many people stop and ask. You know, friends change because people are scared of cancer, and so they just kind of migrate away. Well, they migrate away from the caregiver um, also. So, um, and we don't, you know, we think of, there's a, a bit of stigma, that, there's stigma that comes with cancer anyway, but there's stigma and isolation, a different kind of isolationism that comes with um, caregivers. 
because a lot of times they don't have the opportunity to go do what they would do normally. They have to stay home and keep company or take care of or uh, what have you. And then when we wake up two months later, six months later, a year later, maybe when treatment is over, as an example, then all my friends have changed. Life has changed. The way I think has changed. Um, and then the element of self. How we think about ourselves. I mean, we are constantly changing. Whether or not we like it or we want to, we are constantly changing. And the cancer experience impacts the caregiver in a way that we start questioning maybe, hmm, what, what is this all about? Okay, um, so some of the work that I have done, since we don't have a, we don't have a lot of good information out there to really look at the, at the caregivers and to tell their story, if you will, um, from their viewpoint, the best that we can do is take a look at what the cancer, look at the cancer survivor, see what's available, what, what um, bubbles up out of their stories, and then see if we can make any comparisons whatsoever uh, from the cancer care partner. And in preliminary work, if you will, these are kind of the, the six different areas which we'll go over really, really pretty quickly. Um, what was found was is that from a language standpoint, cancer survivor, and these are only a minuscule number uh, or ex topics here, but the cancer survivor advocacy, there's health policy, there's the medical model, there's the personal narrative, meaning personal narrative is the story that the cancer survivor would tell. The medical model is how does that person um, fit into whatever the treatment's going to be, however, whatever goals are going to be set, health policy is at a bigger perspective. Um, that's where um, the different languages that we have. In the cancer care partner, um, as I've already said, no common language, but in terms of the patient experience, over and over and over again, when you ask a caregiver, how are you doing? They'll say, well, you know, my mother, my husband, slept really well last night, so it's a good day. And it's in terms of the patient. That's what we, that's what we find a lot. Identity, self-identity. Um, cancer survivor, we've already talked about, not, these are mostly positive terms for the cancer survivor. What you find in the literature for the cancer care partner is that they're a survivor. Well, that is, I mean, that's never taken traction. Um, the survivor's caregiver, which just lends to, I'm not my own person, but I'm this person taking care of this person over here. Co-survivor, you'll find that a little bit. Um, and just doing my job. The, the point of this is, is that there's, this is more positive than this part is over here. Metaphors and an out, or nope, not quite yet, societal reaction. Uh, we've talked a little bit about this. Um, we want to, whether or not the cancer survivor really wants to celebrate and have a community or you know, be in a place of honor, we tend as a society to couch it that way. Over here under the cancer care partners, what was found more is, is that they're invisible. They're in the background. They are who they've always been, which is what does that mean? And then um, the um, stigma and isolatedness that we've already talked about. And then metaphors and analogies. The some that had cropped up, um, I'm like Phoenix out of the ashes. I was like a warrior on the battlefield, etc. On the cancer care partner, what was found is I'm the keeper of the worry. Um, just call me the invisible man. And I'm the third wheel at the party sometimes. The last, or the next to last category of meaning of well being. We have um, the cancer survivor, there's lots of literature out there, there's lots of educational sessions out there about self care, prevention, all of these things. Um, in the cancer care partner, where they get to is when are things going to get back to normal? And it's not about me, again, it's about the cancer patient or survivor. And then finally, under social support and connectedness, there's a lot of things for the cancer survivor. You know, thank goodness for Kay and Stephanie, um, we have a time to heal how many years ago. 
and we have those kind of programs, but there's, there's lots and lots of things that are available. They might not always be used, but a lot of things that are available for the cancer survivor, but for the cancer care partner, there are things available. But education, education generally is about the things that I need to be able to take care of my cancer patient or my cancer survivor or how I can support them. Not, um, you don't find a lot of education out there that is just directed at, I have feelings, I have thoughts, here's things I can do um, through the different phases. And then advocacy for the survivor. Uh, again, you know, they can go and be advocates at a national level, a local level for their survivor, but not necessarily for themselves. And then group. We do have groups for them. Sometimes um, they get caught in with cancer survivors. I mean, it's really hard to take cancer survivors and caregivers and, you know, pull them apart. But one thing it has been found, and that is, is that caregivers don't necessarily want to talk in front of their cancer patient, and um, particularly if it's something negative that they're feeling in the moment, as an example. But there are groups. Um, I put diagnosis and bereavement because um, there are more programs, if you will, and more checkpoints at that early stage and then at the end of life stage for caregivers. But it's that middle part about, and, and I'll tell you why that's important in just a minute, but it's that middle part that we don't have, uh, we don't know what really works. And then, you know, social media. There, there are groups that you can join on social media, but most of the time we're over here. My summary points is, is that the language of survivorship is messy. Hopefully, um, I conveyed that it is, can be very confusing as related to care partners. Um, we know, and nobody would say differently, or maybe I should just ask the question, does anybody believe that care partners are not important in, in the cancer journey? Of course not. And then um, care partner contributions are expected, um, but not necessarily acknowledged by society. And if you look at um, any other country, um, there are monetary, re not rewards, but monetary ways. Um, there are different ways to support the caregiver if they have to come out of the workforce. We don't really have much of that um, here, but it is an expectation in our country that we do take care of, you know, you're obviously going home to somebody or you're gonna put them somewhere. And, um, and then a common language does not exist to describe the care partner's experience, particularly in that transition into survivorship. Okay, I am going to rework my, <clears throat> my model just a little bit for the purposes, for one purpose and one purpose only. This was the wait and see portion, um, but research has shown, there's some work, um, there's a reference in there from Steinweedel, um, Tolbert, and Olson have done a little bit of work that has found that caregivers or care partners have the worst time, the, the, the point of transition that is the worst for them is right here. After that original acute treatment or that primary treatment, because what happens? You're not going back to your, um, you're not going back for treatment, so you're not going back to the doc as often as you were. Um, with your, and sometimes, sometimes uh, caregivers aren't available to go and patients are going themselves. But the processing time of what this experience has, has been is when the caregiver can actually wake up at this point in time and realize, oh, I've been through cancer. What does this mean for me? Um, and they're so busy trying to support the person that's going through this awful business um, and their roles have changed and they're just living day to day, but right here is when they stop to process. So upheaval. Um, upheaval, I mean, it, this is not surprising. Um, at that transition point, we're talking about emotional, um, social, physical, and spiritual. So what does that um, mean? I've been doing a pretty good job of blabbing without looking at stuff, so. 
but I know that I wrote some last notes. Maybe not so much. Um, these in red are the ones that bubble up to the top. And um, these things can be experienced long into survivorship, whether or not somebody um, progresses, their, their patient progresses into um, advanced disease or what have you. These are the three things that are the most disturbed um, once of hitting that point um, after the first um, active treatment. And self-identity, it's waking up and going, I feel different, am I different, my role in the world is different, what does that mean? So trying to figure that out. And um, these are not that much different from what the cancer patient and survivor go through too. But fear of recurrence and loss, not just loss of a person, but loss of life um, as we knew it. And then uncertainty. You know, when's this ugly thing going to come back, or is it ever going to come back? Um, from a social standpoint, we've really already talked about isolationism, but it's like almost starting over again um, for some people at what do I want to spend my time doing? And then change in social relationship. And then this one, again, financial toxicity hits everybody. Physical. Um, all three of these things are related to obviously needing more sleep or being able to get to sleep. Um, this one down here I think is going to creep up. That's just my own, my own prediction, but being you know, in the fog. Um, I, I'm, I'm not going to say any more about that because I, I don't have anything behind me uh, in the literature or whatever have you other than thinking about COVID, you know, not just the having COVID, but coming out of COVID and being in um, caregiving for my father and, the, and doing it from two hours, two and a half hours away can be very difficult sometimes. And you, the rest of your life just kind of disappears um, for a while. So I think coming out of the fog is, is going to be a big one coming down the pike. And then spiritual. We don't talk much about faith and religion, but people have a different kinds of faith. People have religion, and those things do impact um, what we're thinking from a spiritual standpoint. But meaning making, you know, again, what is this experience that, that I have been through, and what does that mean, and where is that going to take me, and how am I going to build my best life? Because caregivers need to build their best life too. And so how do we miss the mark? Um, we miss the mark via our literature with our caregivers in that moment of moving into um, that one transition is we lack in social support. Now, there are thing, there, social support is defined as, um, I guess I have pictures, so I'll move in just a minute. But Social support, unrecognized shifts in that whole self-identity and figuring out who I am at this point, um, dealing with intense decision-making and, and then um, unprocessed loss. Okay, so lacking in social support. We don't know from the perspective of the caregiver about what would have been most important in that transition time and out for a year, two, three, what have you, that bridges us to the next phase. And um, we don't know it from their perspective. We have programs out there, and we've had very, um, we've had not-for-profits, we've had um, the medical community that have come forward and designed programs, but we're not getting people to them. People won't show up. Is it because they don't have time, they don't have energy, um, they need to get other things done, so we're missing the mark. But yet they tell us, I mean, they will tell us that, that they have all these, you know, um, feelings and all these things that are going on when they stop and they're asked about, um, about themselves. So what does, that, what does that mean? What can we do? Unrecognized um, shifts in sense of self. Um, it's a hard one. We don't, we don't, we don't know again, from the perspective of the caregiver, because we haven't asked. 
Um, we don't ask it on a daily basis. Um, we don't have a me medical professionals don't have a means by which to ask once we move into that transition period unless they're coming into the office. We don't have follow-up programs for caregivers at the moment um, in, that, in, in that middle ground. We just don't know. Uh, intense decision making. Who's making decisions? Are we making decisions with our partner? Are we making decision, plain decisions about what we're going to do about the finances? Are we making decisions with our uh, about the partner and things down the down the road this encompasses a whole lot of things because of that communication sometimes that communication barrier between um, partner who doesn't want to express feelings and then you also have cancer patients and survivors who try to protect their caregiver who's already given so much you see that happening too and this probably wasn't the biggest, um, wasn't the, the best picture for unprocessed loss because, you know, we immediately think loss, we've lost our person, but not necessarily. We've lost our life, we've lost the things that we enjoyed that we might not be able to do now. Um, we've lost the art of planning, you know, it, can we plan a vacation? How far in advance can we plan a vacation? Um, that's life. But nonetheless, it's that point in time that I had pointed out that people are starting to process their loss and don't always have the mechanism by which to get it done. And then um, I come back again to the power of story. Why is it important? Um, when I was talking about support for caregivers, I failed to mention that there's informal support and there's, and there's formal support. Formal support might be what we come up with as a program for, for caregivers, if we can get them there, if, if that makes sense, but there's also informal. How can we help, you know, if you think of caregiving, you know, you've got your closest knit person or group of people that are taking care of the person with cancer who's been diagnosed, but there's another group of people that can be taking care of the first line caregivers, and you can imagine that social network that happens. How can we or how can we communicate to those other circles about how they can help support? And if we have all these people helping support, um, then that's our informal network. And so how can we do a better job of that? One way is purely um, getting the story of the caregiver out there so that we can identify. Um, we, know what we know what a lot of the needs are but we are not telling the story. We're not giving people the place by which they can tell their story. And I'm not talking about I was born on November 21st in 1902. Um, I'm, you know, I'm talking about those pieces that are the most important in the moment, in a safe place. And I'm going, I'll go back in a minute. Um, there's, when you, if you are so inclined, of course, there's that reference list. But I'm going to go to this first, and then um, I, I, I just really like this. Um, I found this somewhere along the line, and it just says, caregivers go through more than they will tell you. They give up a lot and rarely have a social life. They get sick and emotionally worn out. It's a lot more lot for one person and you will never know until you have walked the road of a caregiver. Caregiver, I see you. I just like that and I just I think it's important. So um, what we're going to do now is uh, since we're a fairly small group is, is that I'm going to ask you to react and we can pop back into um, any of these places um, if we need to see a model or somebody wants to contest something that was said up there. But my, I, does any of this resonate for you as a caregiver or, you know, observing people who have been caregivers? You think about, um, I'm going to go backwards. No, I guess I'm not going backwards. I went forwards and, uh, Sorry. Um.
I don't know if this is the right one or, or, or not where to start, but I just, I, I'm just curious as to, you know, this is literature. This is stuff that's coming out of my dissertation. So um, I shouldn't say out of my dissertation, but it's stuff that I have done prior to. And, and some of this stuff is amazing to me. And some of it is just because even as a healthcare professional, I really didn't think too much about it. I had experiences as nurses along the way, but it's just not that relevant, maybe, I didn't think, because I was too much steeped into the medical model of you know, patients and survivors. And that's where I had to give my energy. So what do you think? And I'm all about listening to pushback. So criticize away, or what do you think? Yeah, um, and I barely said anything about it except at the beginning. And we're going to, we're going to finish with an exercise that um, talks, doesn't talk, it's just doing a little self-compassion. But to answer your question or to talk to you about it, um, it's, it's interesting. We are doing, um, I guess I can say this, even though it's on, on the air, if they're going to, from about here on, they're going to cut this out. So this, this part of the conversation won't be on there. But Wings of Hope, where I volunteer, which um, one place I volunteer, we are doing discovery circles and learning circles. And right now, um, Carolyn and I, uh, not right now because I, in part three, I'm not participating in, but we have done a three-part series looking at self-compassion. And there's a person by the name of Kristen Neff, Dr. Kristen Neff, um, that does a lot of work. And Chris Gimmer? Grimmer? Germer. Germer. Okay. Um, that's Carolyn, by the way, in case those of you who don't know. <laughs> so... Um, they have done a lot of work on this, on this topic of, of self-compassion. And um, it's very much, in a nutshell, I guess, it's very much like um, the mask, the oxygen mask on an airplane. I mean, that old, that old analogy. If you don't put the mask on first and you don't take care of yourself first, how can you have anything left for anybody else? Self-compassion starts with, um, do you forgive yourself? You know, we all know that we are suffering, suffering uh, in some way at some time along, along the path. And you have to understand what's going on with you first to be able to take in maybe love, kindness, whatever it is that you might need for the things that you don't like about yourself, that you don't want to be a, you know, don't want to feel because it feels bad. Um, it, it's that loving kindness that you can have for yourself um, as you work your way through um, whatever your feelings and thoughts are. And Carolyn would say, first of all, um, which is so very true, you have to be able to even label and acknowledge the fact that you're, that you're even hurting in some way. And, and that kind of, that's how self-compassion ties back to me with caregivers. It's one point that if you don't take care of yourself, I mean, people call self-care, but I think self-compassion is a part of self-care. That's a whole nother, that's a whole nother. But Kristen Neff, look up Kristen, Dr. Kristen Neff. If you go and Google her, if you go to the net, she, they've got a whole website that you can pull off free stuff and you can easily read um, a little bit more about self-compassion. But that is a very good point. And I have made a mental note about self-compassion and caregivers. It's important. What else?
I'm so glad that I came to the Middle East Church. I thank you very much because so many of these things you know really ring true. And, um, you know, but it's really like you know getting up every day and um, uh, doing the you know doing my meditation, the mindfulness, and uh, the self compassion, uh, listening to classic um, podcasts. You know, just even coming. Indeed. I think the spin-off that kind of caught me was we, we had up there, I am the keeper of the word. And I thought, you know, by going through that journey with them, you know, whether it's being a parent or spouse or sister, brother, whatever, you know, their life is changing, their life is changing. And then like we had said, kind of wrapping around that spiritual thinking that, you know, how to process all of that. And I think it really, you know, I just, it's a huge, huge piece. And with each family member that goes before us, I think it gets, it doesn't get easier. I mean, we might be smarter about how to set things up and handle it, but, you know, that emotional loss of life, that's You know, that's, um, to add a little piece of my story that's happening right now, it's really easy to set up the medications, work with the girlfriend to, you know, a hospice is coming on this day, we'll get the bath done, you know, we'll do these physical kinds of things. But the thing that is the hardest is, is to um, see my father cry when he's in that long-term care place where we had to put him because he couldn't be safe any other time, but he was going to bust out of there. And, and, and he, he knows us. I mean, you know, he can remember things from 19, you know, 45 and, and all these things as a, as a child and what have you, but him crying because he doesn't like being in that place because it's not familiar. It's not the people that take care of him. He doesn't have any independence. And so what do we do? Um, we let him out and he's living back at his girlfriend's and we worry every day but it's that emotional part. I, I totally can be in tune to that emotional part and how hard it is. Well, and that whole COVID thing, mm -hmm. I think we were so grateful that our dad did pass before COVID hit because I could not even ask her. You know, there's been a lot of people that have been on their own to get through that dying process. And, I mean, COVID just did nobody any favors. Yeah. sisters and when our mom was dying of cancer you know there were eight of us kids so then you know there were like a bunch of us that could really care for her but now I think families are smaller and smaller and if you only have one or two children and they live far away you tend to have even less support or fewer people on deck to help you through the situation you know so I think in that respect, you know, um, you kind of miss out on a lot of support if you just have a real small family. Yeah, and, um, you know, so I have, uh, I'm, I'm just relating. Of course, you know, it's really hard not to relate when, when you got things going on. And as I think um, right now in the moment, I have four, um, I have three brothers and I have, two, I have two brothers and one sister. My sister is the closest. I'm the only medical person. And I think about, even though I'm three, two and a half hours away from there, I'm still on the phone because I'm interacting with the oncologist because I can talk the language. I'm interacting with my sister who needs support because she's getting the uh, you know, fire from what the older people don't want to hear, you know, all this kind of stuff. And so big, small. And, and being mobile, you know, everybody's mobile and lives in different parts of the country. It's really, really hard. Just what part of Kansas are you from, girl? 
Holton, north of Topeka. It, get on 75 and crawl down two and a half hours, and there, that's me. I do. And you're getting your master's at the University of Utah? I'm getting my PhD at the University of Utah. It was, um, it, so it's all online. Um, I'm done with coursework. It was in real time. I'm, you know, I, but I have meetings all the time with my advisor and my committee. But it's also a very isolating experience, but that's not part of today. Kay's my friend who listens to me bitch about, <laughs> <laughs> bitch about that. Yes, you are. You know, something you said that I um, really had such a struggle with was we could, when we were doing the times of healing, we had caregivers healing us. And we, uh, for a long time, had a research study and we kept saying, so these research instruments apply to you yourself. So if you're a survivor, fill it out how you're doing. And if you're a caregiver, fill it out how you're doing. And we get all this data back, and it was all about the survivor. No matter what we asked them, they had no identity in that room except what they were doing as a caregiver for, you know, caregivers. And so we eventually had to, like, stop asking people to do that. But before we did, I, I said to somebody that I knew was going to struggle with this anyway, so really and truly what we want to know is how you're doing. And they said, I don't know. I, they had completely lost that feel. It was all what they knew, what they viscerally knew was how their survivor was doing. And that loss of self that you alluded to, you know, from I, I've done some caregiving, not to the level that Ann has, because I was so young that when my dad needed care, eventually we had to have someone else. But um, I just didn't realize the loss of self of caregivers until I got in. Because I'm a, a nurse too, so you see it in a different way. Um, amazing, yeah. Great to yes. really bring that out because it's really true. It, it, it's hard, and um, I, I'm just I'm just not too far away from. Um, getting ready to get what they call IRB, that'll mean something to some people, approval, um, to launch my real live dissertation work. And uh, so like within a week, I'm hoping I'm gonna be recruiting. We're going to address some of these very things because I think it's important. Um, yeah, if anybody's interested and, and Well, it's changed so many times. It's, it's, if I can remember it right now, um, cancer survivor, or I'm sorry, cancer patient is to survivor as care partner is to question mark. And then it's exploring self-identity. Um, it, it's exploring the care partner's self-identity and um, trying to find out what social support they would have wanted uh, from their own words. Like how, long was your how, how long ago was your father diagnosed? <laughs> we started to try to get a diagnosis in October. We finally got a diagnosis um, right before Christmas. So your post job started even before you knew yes. your father was getting or struggling with cancer. Right. I also, um, 13 years ago, cared for a stepmom who uh, had lung cancer and died. So. Those are my two biggest experiences personally. So, so. So, if you wanted our names, what 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 kind of data? Oh, I'm sorry. So, um, I'm not supposed to talk about it too much yet. Oh, so, no. so no, that no, that's okay. But but no, but that's okay. What I'm going to be doing is um, two interviews with. Um, care partners who have a care survivor who has been out of treatment for nine months at least or more. Um, we also are looking at people that are in remission. It, their cancer survivor needs to be in remission or cured. It, it may seem like an odd population, but that's, that's what we get 
at that transition point is, is we need to understand that better. So, so anyway, a time to heal is going to help me as our other organizations get the word out. So if you're on the mailing list and you are on the mailing list because you're at this conference, so um, you'll see it, you'll see it. Um, it is, I have to say it's 10.03, so I have to let you go, but if you wanted to spend another two minutes doing a, another shift aware or a shift appreciate and wait, we can do that. So, um, so otherwise feel free to leave if you need to. But um, so once again, I invite you to just practice shift and appreciate and wait exercise with me in, the, uh, in relationship to self-compassion. And this time we are going to um, kind of let your, again, let your eyes go soft, close your eyes, um, just be settled for a minute and start breathing. Just concentrate on your breathing for a few seconds. And as you're focusing on your breathing, think of your inhale as breathing compassion in for yourself. And as you exhale, you are breathing out compassion to those that you care for. Breathing in self-compassion, breathing out compassion for others. Appreciate the fact that you are who you are and that self-compassion is a right for you. Again, breathing in self-compassion, breathing compassion out. And just wait, just breathe, just wait and be in the moment. At your convenience, come back to your, the space we share and have a lovely day.